to what King Edward IV is doing. You can see a, a, a body of archers now running behind him as well. I would hazard a guess that these are Lancastrian archers. They're coming across to the Lancastrian camp as well, possibly acting on the information from our solitary spy there. Ah, no, we have archers from both sides, and there appears to be a small amount of uh, harassing shooting going on already. You shoot a bow, you don't fire it. Archers get really funny about that. <laughs> So a little bit of a little bit of a contretemps happening there, a bit of an amuse bouche, if you will. And uh, the Lancastrian rider is there. He's reporting in a moment. I am sure he sent a, a foot messenger back to Margaret of Anjou, back to Gobis Hall, where she spent the night. So Gobis Hall actually is a, a farmhouse which was around this this actual geographical area, and we see now. On your right, a great number more of the archers coming onto the field, onto the Yorkist side. Lancastrians also receiving more of a build-up of men. You can see they're there. They're sorting themselves out, they're sorting their arrows out, getting it all convenient for when the hostilities actually start. And coming onto the field now, if you're on your extreme right, in about 30 seconds, you're going to see the troops of Devon coming on, Devon being the far flank of the Lancastrian course, army. Course, course. Are there any Lancastrians in the house? Can I have a cheer for the house of Lancaster? <laughs> nice. <laughs> so the first of the Lancastrian foot troop are now taking the field. The Lancastrians had a lot more foot troop than did the Yorkists. Yorkists had more mounted well combatants. Short as we are led to believe by the chronicles of the time. <laughs> I did have a look at the arrows though and they've got really mad big soft tips on the end. You hear the captain of the archers shouting their commands and the harassing fire continues, the longbow being the principal weapon of destruction, if you will, of this part of the Middle Ages. So here up the crowd line you can see the army of the Earl of Devon, marching proudly on under the Devon banner. These are West Country Hang on, that guy surely is And Devon's got a lot to prove. <laughs> He's been given his title, made Earl of Devon, by Margaret and her family. And so if he needs to keep that, and he needs to keep the lands and the reputation that go with the cross of the West Country, he's got to fight and survive today. A wild man, a true man, solid, capable, the sort of person to whom you want to give the left wing of your army. Standing there proudly with the plumes of his helmet at the head of his men, as those of you on the left-hand side of the crowd, you see. <laughs> Keep your eyes for a guy on the left, on the, you on the left, with yellow feathers in his helmet. As he passes down in front of you, that's the Earl of Devon. <laughs> And taking the field swiftly behind the Earl of Devon, we have the she-wolf herself. We have my lady Margaret of Anjou. And if you want to welcome her onto the field, a good cry of Anjou will probably do the job quite nicely. She is a lady not to be messed with. She spent the last night in a local farmhouse in conditions which she's probably found less than, less than comfortable. And she's now here with her 18-year-old son, the young Prince Edward. He's fought in one battle previously, the Battle of St. Albans. So he is a tried and tested combatant. He was uh, able to give commands. He was, co he was give commands to have certain men executed after the Battle of St. Albans. But he is fairly inexperienced. <laughs> because he is inexperienced, he's all the more delighted to be commanding officially at the centre of the battle today, alongside Lord Wenlock. He knows he's young. He also knows he's the grandson of Henry V, 
the hero who won the Battle of Agincourt. And unlike his pathetic, decrepit father, this is a warrior in the prime of life, just coming into his full manhood. His mother's pride of joy. And here they move along in front of you with the white treble plumes of the Prince of Wales in his helmet. And behind them, the French bodyguard in blue and white of Anjou. And these, ladies and gentlemen, are real French people who come across the channel to join us each year and fight for their queen. Anjou! Anjou! <laughs> Vive la reine! <laughs> Anjou! And the louder you shout back, the better they fight later. Shout of Anjou! 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 The young, fairly untried Prince of Wales, who is uh, is there to gain the experience and hopefully to gain the crown back. And now the final battle of the Lancastrian side. We have my Lord, the Duke of Somerset, and uh, he's a slightly nefarious character, shall we say? Well, that's your right. Let's be honest. He's the most charismatic of the adult commanders of Lancaster. He's intelligent, he's brave, he's dashing. He has just one possible weakness, he's impulsive, impatient. The kind of guy who takes sudden decisions. Now they could be the kind that snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, or they could be the kind that go wrong. We need to see what's going to happen today, but this is a man to watch. The most exciting yep, the of Lancaster's the commanders, the Duke of Somerset, <laughs> with his plumes blue and joke. white in his helmet. <laughs> and he also has a very dashing beard. He's huge. And a cry of a Beaufort to Beaufort there. I wonder which side you're on. Notice the banners flying bravely there. And these men walking like they're tired. They have just had to march, a forced march, across fairly evil terrain. The <laughs> this one here still got enough spirit to give you some grief as well. Ah, uh, it's a wee free man. The gentleman at the back there appears to be about to put his tent up. He's got his mallet with him. <laughs> and there we have a little block of a mad axe men at the end there. Huh. Looking like rather resplendent. And still they come, each with their own personal battle cry, their own personal chant. And we have a levy coming on here, one of the many levies, uh, who Margaret is trying to get over the seven to get to Jasper Tudor, who has more men to fight for the Lancastrian cause. It could be one of these levies has already come over to join them. Noisy bunch over here, the long pole weapons in the pale blue and white. Uh, the Hungerfoots, it would appear. A good win, a good win, sir, indeed. And here we have. Some of the Tudors fighting for the Lancastrian cause. Clue there is in the name. Good afternoon, Mr. Cazel. How lovely to see you again. And they have their piper just to really irritate people as well. <laughs> to put fear into the heart of 
just about everybody, frankly. And they also have a small artillery piece coming onto the field. The Lancastrians started off with a great number of artillery pieces, so we're led to believe, and had to, in the forced march, had to leave a lot of them behind, which, if you believe the uh, chronicles, the Yorkists gleefully snaffled. So now I'm on the field, oh, I do apologise, sir. Oh, to you. <laughs> I have a quick anecdote to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, about our Prince of Wales today, or rather the gentleman who is taking the role of Margaret's son, the Lancastrian Prince of Wales. He's allergic to horsefly bites. And earlier this week, he was bitten badly on the ankle by a horsefly, and it swelled right up. So much so, he couldn't put on his armour on his legs. Now, what does he do? Does he stand aside and let an understudy take over? Does he rest? Is he sensible? No, yesterday he drives to Swindon and back to see the right doctor and get the right antibiotics. And today the swelling has gone down sufficiently. His armour is on and though limping a little bit, he's in action for us. These are the kind of people who are reenacting for you today. They are utterly worthy of the great dead that they represent. I absolutely agree. The round of applause, I think that is lovely. That's very appropriate indeed. And as Professor Ronald just said, remember, men actually fought and died on this field. This isn't just playing games. This is remembering something that actually happened. So we have the Lancastrian army formed up, as you can see, into the three battles at the end there. We have, from left to right, we have Somerset, Wenlock on the Prince, and we have Devon. Now coming onto the field on the Yorkist side, are there any Yorkists in the house? Can I have a big shout from the Yorkists? Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> you know, you poor misguided individuals. However, we have got my Lord Hastings block coming on now. Uh, under the sign, I believe that's a maunch on the sign? It is indeed, yeah. yes. The sign of the black maunch there. A Hastings is maunch. somebody who owes everything to the House of York. He was raised it's from a being a minor Midland noble to being the man in charge of the centre of the country. Like the Earl of Devon on Lancaster's <laughs> side, he knows that his entire <laughs> career has been <laughs> built on loyalty to a certain family. You know what, Sigan, that's fantastic. We have and bird he's going to take the right way today, opposite the Earl of fish. Devon. And these two <laughs> newly arrived men are going to fight yeah, to the death for their titles, <laughs> their lands, and all they hold dear. <laughs> Still, the Thanks, Yorkist Tim. right Inside. flank come onto the field. You can see there, there's some gentlemen who are wearing what appears to be kilts. These are, in fact, a group of Irish mercenaries, and they are being, they're being paid to fight. They're wearing what's yeah, called lena, which just means long shirt, with armour on top of that. Hey. Vicious, <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot. smelly, horrible <laughs> yeah. fighters. Is say very, that to the, the, the red-headed so Connolly. You see some of the yeah. artillery pieces now <laughs> being brought onto the field on the Yorkist side. <laughs> He's surrounded. If you imagine By two. the loudest sound yeah, most of these men have ever heard in their lives be the sound of church bells like or thunder, <laughs> they are suddenly up against something that is making a noise Strange. like hell and a smell like hell as well, because black powder really, really reeks. You'll get a smell of that as soon as they start shooting off the artillery pieces. But the Yorkists do seem to have still some of their large artillery pieces, including possibly a reboldequin over on the end there. That's uh, the most basic kind of automatic firer uh, in existence. It's nine chambers, nine tubes, all linked to fuses. And uh, it's one shot and you get nine, nine uh, ball out of it. Now, coming on to the centre, I believe, we have the King's Battle coming on. Am I right in saying that? We have the King's Battle coming on into the centre. And Gloucester is, as I speak, coming onto the field on the Yorkist right. You can see the Gloucester banner there with the lions. Here's another family drama for you because, yes, King Edward has got his kid brother with him, commanding his left wing. 18-year-old Richard 
Nobody yet knows that he is going to grow up to become the most controversial king in English history, Richard III. At this stage, he's a teenager. He's fought in one battle, that's the one in which Warwick got killed and London got taken again. He's devoted to his brother, he hero worships him. And he's been stricken since childhood with scoliosis, a curvature of the spine that really hurts. And he's made up for it by exercising daily with arms and armour to prove himself a man. And now he's up against the experienced Duke of Somerset, the Lancastrian hothead. Young Richard has an awful lot to prove. Indeed he does. And the last of the uh, Yorkist troops now taking the field. They are Whatever in several do, rays, one behind back. the other. A line of troops, one beside the other, is called a ray. And several of them would be called a ray. It's so very much like no the way in badly. No, no, that would be fine. fine. The Prince and the Queen now down on the Lancastrian side with the uh, Lancastrian outrider from earlier <laughs> are now walking up and down the line. They're speaking to the troops, they're rallying them, they're giving them good heart. The exchange of arrows between the two sets of archers appears to have been fairly innocuous. Maybe they were just getting their eye in. Well, you don't want to get your eye in an arrow, well, arrow in your eye? No. Yeah, someone did that once, didn't they? And you didn't hear the cry going up, a Lancaster, a Lancaster. <laughs> the Yorkist side, they're still forming themselves up, still fairly quiet. We've got the commanders speaking with their men. The gunners there, all charging the guns, making sure they are all ready, primed, ready to fire. As soon as the king, King Edward IV, dedicates this battle, to God, to God's mother, to King King George, Saint George, and then he will give the command for all hell to be let loose. Okay. They're building this up a lot now. Sorry? They're building this up a lot now. There's, there's yeah, a lot yeah, to live yeah, up to yeah. Well, obviously limbs. I believe there has to, uh, in, this, in this day and age, we'd have had mobile no. communications, which would have enabled no, the, uh, the two commanders and this person in the middle just throw in the to make a arm and leg. There's no such thing. You have to have what's called a parlay, <laughs> where the leaders of each they want of the sides meet each other face to face in the middle of a field and agree to disagree. I mean, uh, now, I don't think that's going to go well. Parlay. <laughs> A party coming onto the field. All of them are massed banners, carrying the helmet with the white plumes in front of him there, showing that the king is indeed bareheaded. He wants parley. This isn't actually an attack. He has brought a lot of friends with him just in case, though. And you have at the front there, on the Lancastrian side, you have the she wolf herself, you have her young son, you have Wenlock, I believe. the Tudor banner there, bringing up the rear. Make no doubt about it, both these adults now striding forward to face each other, Edward and Margaret, regard the other as the devil incarnate. There is nothing but hatred between them. And there is the young prince going forward in front of his mother to confront the man whom he regards as the worst enemy his family has ever known. At last, for the first time in their lives, they're face to face as adults, each sparring verbally with the other. It's an interesting point of um, honour or dignity, perhaps, that the king is bareheaded. The young prince of Wales there is retaining his helmet. Ah! Oh. Oh. And Edward's just shoved the prince. This is not courtly behaviour at all. Margaret's got forward to confront the man she hates. And oh. she's just slapped him twice, straight in the face. I think you could say that the negotiations have broken down. You could indeed. Edward still bows to her ironically. And now they fall back. Now of Santa Michaela or a Pronovis coming from the Yorkist side. The men are starting to get themselves worked up into a frenzy. 
where they feel no pain until it's all far too late. And we have some of the hand gunners coming on on the Lancastrian side. If you look to the left of you now, facing against the York hand gunners who've been in position for a little while. <laughs> hand gun being a relatively new, a relatively new device, fairly terrifying. Look out for smoke rings. That's a very pretty part of the hand gunner. It shows that gunners have souls. Really. <laughs> And as you can see, the, ac the accuracy of these guns is um, somewhat negotiable. None of the barrels are rifled. They are all the most basic tube on a stick. Once the board has left the end of that barrel, it could pretty much go where it please. No, I think that's done. I think it's negative. If the loud noise worries you, open your mouth slightly and cup your hands over your ears. <laughs> you see the smoke now drifting across the battlefield, just taken by the slight wind. I can just smell it, I can just smell the sulphur and the salt pizza on the breeze. Inhale, but not too deeply. The smoke is somewhat laxative. <laughs> uh, you think I'm joking? No, it's something every reenactor knows. <laughs> Never ever go into a port loo after a gunner. <laughs> Historically speaking, this was the first war in English soil at which that thunder of the guns was heard. They're still pretty inaccurate. They're at long range here. Yeah. So although the Orcus have got the heavier guns, they're not going to do a lot of damage to their castrips, but they can soften them up. Bear in mind, if these shots did actually find a human target, it wouldn't just go through the man himself, it would go through him, the man behind him, and probably the man behind him as well. It wasn't nice. Most of these would have been loaded with uh, chain shots, which is a great deal of damage. There's a smoke ring. How beautiful. <laughs> Uh, chain, chain shot or grape shot, because it does maximum damage, particularly to cavalry. It also scares the living daylights out of the horses. And what you don't want underneath you is three quarters of a ton of panicking horse flesh. Uh, some of the banners here on the Yorkist side, moving front and centre. Far too long. Not many people beat to death. <laughs> and the gunners, having started things off, having <laughs> softened up each side, some of the men have turned tail and run in fear already. Sadly, the Lancastrians have only got the water to go into. They've got the swill gate and the Avon behind them. And um, they're, they're in a great position as far as defences are concerned, but not for running away. I can hear now my Lord the Duke of Somerset rallying his troops over there on the Lancastrian side. And the centre battle, I believe, is moving forwards here. They're bringing the fight into the Yorkists. Oh no, we have, we have the entire Lancastrian army coming forward. Time for the gunners to fall back, surely. And the Yorkists in their position of relative safety there, just waiting for the battle to come to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cry there of Margaret Anjou on the Lancastrian side. Oh. 
Possibly a little loath to engage, however, he appears to be there right at the very front of his army. And here we have Somerset's block moving forwards. The centre and haste and uh, Devon have stopped. Uh, this should be happening. Uh, I mean, historically it should be, but in terms of common sense, it shouldn't. What's up?